The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Welcome back into the House of Mystery, and you are at the interview part of the show. Uh, today we are um, talking about history, and there's always a lot of questions when it comes to history. And so we're going to uh, focus a little bit on uh, Roman and uh, Caesar and uh, around that time. And uh, joining us is a historian and author, uh, Stephen Saylor. Thank you for being here. Uh, thanks for having me, Al. So, Stephen, uh, now you've you've written a ton of books here on on this the history, you know, like gladiators and all sorts of like. I just I cannot believe how much you've written. Um, what 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 got, what got you into so fascinated that you're into the history so much that you've got so many books out? Well, I ended up uh, settling on ancient Rome is kind of what clicked for me. And a number of years ago, like uh, back in 1991, I published my first novel, Roman Blood, which was a, a mystery novel, murder mystery set in ancient Rome. It was based on an actual trial of the, of the orator Cicero. So I had a actual true crime material to work from. And uh, at that time, it just doesn't seem possible now, but back then, there weren't, there weren't a lot of historical mysteries out there. This was kind of a new genre. So uh, I got in on the ground floor with a, a Roman mystery, and uh, the publisher wanted more. Uh, we sold a lot of translations, uh, so I was off and running. I've had a career writing mystery novels, mostly based on actual history uh, in the time of Caesar and Cleopatra. Yeah, they've really fascinated people for years. Um, but, you know, one thing I've noticed, I, it, we, we just watched a series, I think it was on Netflix, um, about the, the Roman emperors, and it, went, it had three parts to it, and one part did have Caesar, and one had Caligua. And that, but, you know, when I see them, quite often I spot differences or something that is different. Like, you know, back with the... Uh, uh, Liz Taylor movie back in the 60s with Cleopatra right till now, uh, there's there's little differences that, that bother me, um, such as was Caesar married when he was with Cleopatra or was she was his first wife dead already? Oh, no, he was married. He was married, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, Caesar, actually, Caesar, this, in my, my latest novel in the series, The Throne of Caesar, we deal with the assassination of Caesar. And uh, once he sort of killed off all of his rivals in the Roman civil wars, and he was the top dog, and the Roman Republic was about to become a dictatorship and have an emperor at the head, uh, he was sort of made a dictator for life. And another special uh, favor he was going to get out of the Senate was he would be able to have as many wives as he wanted, because he was kind of a transcendent figure. He was the emperor of the world. So he, it was, as he traveled around conquering regions, he would need to marry a queen or a woman from each of those and have children, have royal children. And that's one of the things that got him assassinated. He was asking a little too much in the Senate. But no, he was married uh, to Calpurnia from a good family in Rome uh, as he was carrying on with Cleopatra halfway across the world. Yeah, because that's what, because uh, it seemed to me he came back, when he came back with Cleopatra and stuff, that his wife was there, but... In this series we just watched, um, they made no mention of her. Well, there's, they sort of leave her out. You know, he, she's in the play by Julius Caesar. I believe she has a, a, a scene or two where she's talking to Caesar. Uh, she's the one who doesn't want him to go to the Senate that day. She has a bad dream that night. And she wakes up in the morning and says she's had a portent and an omen. Don't go to the Senate today. Caesar almost doesn't go, but then somebody persuades him to go because they need to assassinate him. So uh, a friend of his who's in on the plot sort of talks him into going, and that's how history happens. Uh, but you mentioned the movie Cleopatra with Liz Taylor. I'm glad you do that because sometimes I'm asked how I really got into Roman history, even as a child, and that was because uh, long ago in the 1960s when I grew up, the big movies were all about ancient Rome. Spartacus, Ben-Hur, which won all those Oscars. And uh, for me, the touchstone is the Cleopatra movie with Liz Taylor, which received a very bad rap at the time, but I think it's really one of the best movies ever made about ancient Rome. 
Yeah, I, I thought it was done well, but then, you know, I'm not a history major, especially in Roman. Um, so I wasn't sure, because, yeah, it did get a bad rap. You know? No, the history is fairly impeccable. I think what got the film into hot water was being way over budget and having a lot of scandal attached and all of these things, and people didn't like certain parts of the drama. But the actual history, it's, uh, it was made by Joseph Mankiewicz, who did movies like All About Eve, and uh, he was writing the screenplay even as he was filming it, just because it has circumstances for that. And he mined the ancient historians for just the, the best material. So almost everything in that movie is uh, historically accurate, which is unlike many a movie since then about ancient Rome. Yeah, well, I wonder why that is, because when, uh, when you uh, see these series like that, they leave out some important parts, like I said, and it, it sticks with you if you're watching it. it just well, yeah, me. this when, it, when I started writing my books, I mean, one of the things, uh, I studied history in college, it really matters to me, actually, how history is written. And I, I never wanted to just go off and start just riffing on the ancient sources and do whatever I wanted with them. I have known other historical authors who don't mind just changing facts willy-nilly just to fit their plot or what they, need, you know, what they want to do in their book. I've always worked very much within the confines of what we know from the historical sources. I never contradict the history. There's plenty of room in there and the spaces in between that you can fill in. So that's always been my way of doing it, is to be as scrupulous as possible about the real sources because so often I find that when you're studying the ancient historians, they wanted the, the juiciest details. That's what they looked for. So uh, you can't really outdo them as far as just outrageous facts and terrible crimes and so forth. The, what, what's in the actual history is the most fascinating thing. So, Steve, I was just um, thinking as I was listening, I mean, clearly uh, Roman history is a big part of the curriculum here in the UK. And I was just mm. thinking about um, some of our listeners who may not have a full understanding of the story of Caesar. Can, how can you see that just within a very short period of time, just so that our listeners really have an understanding of what we're all talking about this evening? Um, you mean when I'm, when I'm writing my books, how do I sort of make sure that I get readers up to speed? Yeah, and, and, and just to give a very short pricey of, of who Caesar was. Oh, well, we're talking about, this is 2,000 years ago, and uh, the city of Rome has become this uh, uh, powerhouse in, in Italy, and uh, they were a military power. They gained more and more territory, so they became sort of the greatest empire of the ancient world in the Mediterranean world, in Europe. And we just inherited an enormous amount of culture from them, our legal system and things like that, and a lot of stories. Uh, I mean, Caesar is probably best known to many people because they had to read uh, Shakespeare in high school. They had to read the play uh, about the assassination of Caesar. At, at when, when Caesar lived, there had been a republic of Rome with a senate, an oligarchy of rich men running the country for uh, hundreds of years. They had conquered a lot of territory. And they had finally reached the point where they just, they had this big empire, uh, and ultimately there were civil wars between these warlords, and Caesar is the man who came out on top. He was the one who, who beat off all his rivals, and he was going to be the first dictator or emperor of Rome. And then after that comes all that kind of scandalous stuff. You've got Nero burning Christians in the Colosseum, uh, Caligula, one of the insane emperors, uh, up to uh, a golden age with emperors like Hadrian and Marcus Aurelius, who wrote the Meditations book, in which Rome kind of has this, uh, this Pax Romana, there's peace all over the European world, and Rome is the greatest of all the empires. So that's kind of the period that, that I work inside. Hmm. Now, did Caesar, now this is one thing I've, I've learned recently, Caesar was really from uh, a family that was disgraced. Is that true? Um, I don't think that's true. Not oh, really. I heard that, his was father. That in one of those documentaries you saw. Yeah, <laughs> uh, just the one on that. They said that his father had chosen the wrong side in a civil war. Oh well, that's that's entirely possible. But I don't know. I, yes, I mean there there were a series of civil wars leading up to the civil war, which Caesar takes part in, because the Republic is just kind of coming apart at the seams, and. Yes, probably his father had been on the, on the wrong side of one of those, but I wouldn't say he was disgraced because these factions didn't go away. I mean, if you were sort of the losing side for a while, 
you were still sort of fighting to, to get back in. So a disgrace, I wouldn't say, defeated perhaps, yes, on his side of the family. Oh, okay, yeah, that kind of. So now, one of his big battles was against Sparta, Spartacus, right? Uh, not Caesar. That's a no. little early. Well, you know, you know, this gets confusing because in the movie Spartacus with Kirk Douglas, right, they do bring Caesar in and sort of give him a bigger role than he actually had, because they, just people have heard of Caesar, so they want to have Caesar on stage. <laughs> Uh, that takes place a little earlier. I did write a novel. I did write a novel about the Spartacus slave revolt. It's called Arms of Nemesis. And um, uh, that's the second novel in the series. Okay, because I just, I guess I better stop watching these Netflix things. <laughs> well, you know, you know, I tell you what, I wrote, uh, my series is called the Roma Sub Rosa series. And it's 14 novels, and there's 20 short stories. And. If people go to my website, stephensanda.com, I put them all in chronological order. So there are readers who want to kind of read these five decades of Roman history in order, and my books are one of the ways to do it. And I, I hope it's uh, maybe a little more entertaining and inviting than reading a lot of big history books. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's, it's very important, too, because like I said, I the, the one that I just saw told, told me that Caesar's dad was uh, just, just disgraced in it. Well, Caesar actually yeah. won the war against Spartan, the Spartans for his general, and that's why he became uh, consul. Uh, well, at least yeah. in the movie Spartacus. <laughs> 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 yes, that's, yes, that's how that happened, yes. Anyway, uh, so w what can you tell us about the assassination that we probably don't, don't have right? Well, you know, um, Caesar is warned about it by a soothsayer. I think in, in the play by, uh, by Shakespeare. Now, I'll just say as an aside, you know, in doing my research, not only reading all the mm -hmm. ancient histories, but all kinds of adaptations of them, you can't do much better than William Shakespeare. I mean, there's a reason this guy has such a reputation. Uh, because when he goes back and writes his plays about Julius Caesar and then his play about Antony and Cleopatra, and another play about an earlier Roman called Coriolanus. Uh, if you read those and you're studying the history at the same time, uh, Shakespeare yeah. doesn't miss a beat. He, he also does not contradict the history, but he goes in and finds the absolute most yeah. dramatic material, the most vivid characters, and that's what he put into his plays. So in many ways, Shakespeare is a model of historical fiction. Um, so just about the assassination of Caesar, I guess it, my challenge was to try to come at it with something fresh and new and different. And the, one of the problems of being a mystery writer is that if you think you've come up with something that's pretty clever, and maybe somebody hasn't done it in the past, that's the one thing you can't talk about in your book. <laughs> because that's, that's your surprise. That, 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 your twist at the end. Uh, so that's, I mean, as a, as, a, as a writer of mystery novels, I encountered that many times. The thing I most want to tell you about my book is the one thing I can't tell you, because it's a mystery. <laughs> <laughs> and I want you to read the book and be surprised over it. What, what can we say about Caesar? Like, what, what, what kind of a person was he really? Was he like, uh, I've seen him portrayed in so many different ways. So, uh, so. The portrayal by Rex Harrison in the movie Cleopatra with Liz Taylor, uh, always stood out in my mind very vividly and because that was a, just a childhood impression. Uh, but really, the thing about Caesar, I mean, how did this man become ruler of the world? He was a senator, very skilled in politics. He knew how to just pull all kinds of tricks in the legislature. He mastered that. He was obviously very brainy. But then at the same, uh, and, and what really launched him was going off to Gaul, which is modern-day France, which Rome had not conquered at that time, and he conquers all of Gaul. And he just goes out there. He sort of does it illegally. He doesn't really get the, the right uh, instructions from the Senate, but he just goes off on his own. And so actually some people would say he was a war criminal, and he had exceeded his authority. But in Rome, as in most places, the winner, winning is what really matters. And because he came back and he had conquered Gaul, uh, the Romans weren't going to say no to that. But at the same time, his rivals back in Rome are really afraid of him now because he's coming back to Rome with this big army that you know, has all this experience and, and has conquered Gaul. 
and they're going to cross the Rubicon. That's sometimes a famous statement. If you cross the Rubicon, it's, in, it's something you can't go back on. Uh, once he crosses that Rubicon River and goes from the territory where his troops are legal into Italy, that's going to be an act of civil war. And he goes ahead and does it. Uh, and so that launches this war, in which he will ultimately win. So when you're portraying a man like Caesar, first of all, he's, uh, he's smarter than me. He has more military experience. How could I possibly get a hold of Caesar? And I mean, one of the ways, I mean, when I think about these great people and these people who run the world, they're very close to being sociopaths. I mean, Caesar clearly had no guilt or remorse about anything he ever did. He had to just keep moving forward. Um, so really, how, how, how can we get close to him? So in some ways, we could even look at him as a serial killer. I mean, many, many hundreds of thousands of people died because of Caesar and his ambitions. And yet he does this without ever blinking. So he's kind of, a, he's, a, he's a bit, uh, uh, I, I, we don't want to get too far inside his mind. So, Stephen, I know that Al and I have both separately been to the Colosseum and been to Rome, and, and it's certainly humbling to stand in such an arena and try and understand how people lived and fought there. And um, so, you know, there's so much information about ancient Rome and the Romans and the, um, the empire. How did you start a, your journey in understanding it and uh, and also about your research how much research and where do you go to do the research well the research for me is the best part i have to say that's good well, that's why i'm not having to do any actual work i'm back i'm back to being a student again um I, as i said my, my fascination with rome started just from childhood because i had roman toys i had a, a, a roman galley with batteries in it that would go across the floor I saw movies like Cleopatra. So even from childhood, that was a, an, a world of wonder, sort of my escapism. And then when I started going to college, I, I went to college at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, when I found out I could actually be something called a history major and just do nothing but study history, and that was a legitimate pursuit, uh, that's what I wanted to do. Um, so I, I studied history, a lot of Roman history, also uh, just all European history, French Revolution, Russian Revolution, and always the period that fascinated me the most was ancient Rome. That's just what I would always come back to. I left that aside in my 20s when I was just sort of uh, doing newspaper work and things like that, trying to find out what I might do as a writer. And then uh, on my first trip to Rome, uh, which was not until I was in my late 20s, I, I was just my mind exploded when I was there in Rome and actually sort of touching all that ancient marble and actually walking where the ancient, ancients had walked. And I came back to where I was living in, San Francisco, and I wanted to just kind of be back in Rome in my mind all the time. And at the same time, I was falling in love with mystery fiction. I was reading all of the Sherlock Holmes stories. That's, that's what I was doing for uh, Escape That Way. And pardon me, I wanted to read a mystery novel set in ancient Rome. That would be the perfect thing for me. And at that time, believe it or not, there, there wasn't one. Uh, Lindsay Davis had not written her books yet. I hadn't written mine. And so the closest thing I could find was a, a book, uh, Michael Grant's translations of Cicero's Murder House. Cicero was the most famous lawyer of ancient Rome. And he actually, we had his orations for these murder trials that he usually was uh, on, on, the, on the defense. And uh, I thought, well, this is, this is going to get me close to that. It'll be true crime in ancient Rome. And the very first oration in that book is uh, when Cicero was a young lawyer, not yet famous, uh, one of his first cases was defending a man accused of murdering his own father. In ancient Rome, that was the worst of all possible crimes. The, the, the father of the family is the, is the ruler of the family. And so I read that oration, and uh, it, it ended up being a really fascinating crime where just sort of a, the more you know, the more dangerous things get, sort of a John Grisham thriller type of thing. And I thought this would make a great novel, a mystery novel. I wonder if I can do this. And so I spent two years working on uh, Roman Blood, my first novel, making that uh, trial of Cicero into a, a novel. I was going to make Cicero the lawyer, the hero, until I just I couldn't spend all day with Cicero. He's a bit of a prig. So I gave him a sleuth, Guardianus the Finder of Ancient Rome, the guy who would go out and sort of dig up the dirt. And um, that became Roman Blood. And uh, that was, uh, it was just successful enough back in the early 90s 
that the publisher wanted me to write uh, a series, which I hadn't even thought about doing. And that got me set on actually going through that period of Rome, which there's no, there's no end to all the murder trials, the backstabbing. We have a civil war, intrigue, espionage. So the material, there was, there was abundant material. Um, and so uh, that got me set on that. I just started doing, I, I would mine the material for the juiciest material, the, the most heinous crimes, the most thrilling trials. And that's what I would make into my short stories and novels. And I live now in Berkeley, California, a college town. I do lots of research at the library here. I have gone to Rome uh, to do actual research there. And uh, I, I sort of rub elbows with the academics on campus, which makes me feel a bit like an academic, although I am not. I respect what they do so much. I, I never actually call myself a historian. I, I'm really a novelist. But I, uh, I use the historians for, for uh, material. And so uh, my lifestyle has been mainly doing lots of historical research and writing novels about crimes in ancient Rome, which has suited me very well. And if I asked you a bit of a, 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 this is going to be a quite tricky question, I think, but what's the single, um, I suppose, the one piece of information that led you to completely change your view about Roman life or one that informed you the most? Hmm. So that's such a big question. I spend so much time. I live in this sort of ocean called ancient Rome. So where, where are the things that really stand out the most? I think one of the things, um, I guess one of the hardest things to wrap my mind around, in, in my other series of books I write, which are sort of a, a family saga about the, the expanse from the earliest origins of ancient Rome, the age of legend with Romulus and Remus, the twins. And that spans, uh, I've written two very long books, a family saga that's gotten it up to Marcus Aurelius, the great, which people know a bit about him from Commodus, that was, uh, who was in, uh, in Gladiator. Um, and wait, where was I going with this? <laughs> I'm lost in that. Oh, one of the hardest things to get my mind around has been Roman religion, because, you know, they've got all those gods. It's something very important. Everything they have to have, uh, they, they have to have omens taken before they have a battle and make sure that the omens are good. Uh, these things just happen on and on. And that's been the hardest thing for me to try to understand is the actual thought world, what they actually thought, how they thought the universe worked, what caused good and evil, things like that. Um, so, yes, that's sort of the hardest nut to crack. And when you're thinking about the rituals and, um, as you said, about the omens and, and ancient religions, what's the um, is there something we've taken through to today? Is there something that you still see happening today in today's religions, whatever that might be, that um, still has that well, curiosity? Yes, I think, I think people are as superstitious as they ever were in many ways. Um, I don't think we have really changed all that much from the ancient Romans. Although, I mean, the thing about, the thing that, when we think about ancient, the ancient world, it's hard to get a grip on how superstitious they were because, I mean, absolutely nothing was done with that because they didn't know what, they had no science, so they didn't know what caused anything. Even like wind. How did wind happen? Mm. Well, it's because of some spirit is moving things. And everything around them, they saw it sort of had a life of its own. Trees and rocks, it's uh, called animism. Everything has a spirit inside it. That explains, you know, why things happen. And so you couldn't do anything from uh, practically crossing the street to going on a long journey without asking the help of the gods to make sure nothing bad happened to you. And they had a logic for working that out. If you, for example, if you, uh, you ask a god for a favor or something was happening and it didn't turn out well, well, that god didn't really work for you very well, did he? So maybe next time you'll try another god. And if that works out well, okay, I'm sticking <laughs> with him. Because it, it's, it's whatever works. It's very practical, whatever works. But it's all kind of a scattershot. You know, it's, it's really not based on any kind of logic or science. So it's very superstitious. And one time, I, I, every now and then I have flashes in my own life when I think I'm getting kind of back into that mindset where I can kind of understand it. 
Uh, I do a lot of running here in the Berkeley Hills, and it's on fairly rugged fire roads and trails. And uh, one time I was in the park, and I was running, and I passed these two women who are a, a Berkeley sort of woman. They were kind of, there's a certain witchiness about them, sort of an old hippie, <laughs> old hippiness about them. And I, I passed them, and I sort of made that judgment on them as I passed them. Uh, I thought, oh, it's, a, it's two old Berkeley witches. And I rounded a corner. I need to and move, I tripped, I'm from town. <laughs> and I, I tripped over uh, a route and went, went, went head over heels. And if I had been in the ancient world, my immediate thought would have been, uh-oh, I offended the witches. They put a hex on me. Yeah. And that would explain why I fell. So everything has a cause and a consequence. And it's hard for us to imagine living in a world where that's how you move through every day, looking for these signs of what might or might not help you or hurt you, and based on nothing more than, than superstition. Did they actually sacrifice people as well for, for their gods? The ancient Romans and Greeks did not sacrifice humans. And, well, the ancient Greeks did, actually, if you go far enough back. But the ancient Romans did not practice human sacrifice, and it was something they were kind of proud of. They looked down on enemies who did, like the agency of Carthage with Hannibal, one of their biggest rivals in the earliest days. The, the people in Carthage did practice human sacrifice, and that was a thing that the Romans looked down their nose at. So, uh, no, that's, that's not something the Romans did. Now, they did kill lots and lots of people, so they, they weren't above that. But they didn't actually religiously sacrifice people. They, they did sacrifice animals. And, uh, I mean, that was a huge part of the religion. And whenever they would have festivals and everything, they would sacrifice a goat or a sheep or a heifer. And this goes back to something practical, too, because in the ancient world, it sometimes was hard to get a lot of meat. Meat was kind of a, a delicacy. So when you would have a festival and all the common people would come, one of the things you would do would be to, to bring out the heifers or the goats, sacrifice them on an altar. You'd slit their throats. You'd say a prayer. You would offer the spirit of the animal up to the gods. The gods didn't actually need to eat meat. They were above all that. Yeah, so then you would cook the animal, and the gods would actually subsist off the smoke. The smoke was sort of the spiritual essence that went off the animal. So the gods got to smoke. The people got to eat the meat. So in other words, an ancient festival was a big barbecue. It was a chance for everybody to have some charred meat. And as you might imagine, the best parts went to the upper classes and the worst parts went to the lower classes. Uh, but yes, was, sacrificing animals was a religious thing and also a festivity and a chance to eat some protein. Yes, yes it was a practical religion, yes. And actually, uh, animal sacrifice is one of the things that the early Christians looked down on. Uh, and actually, not just the Christians, but many philosophers rose up and started saying, we shouldn't be killing and eating these animals. Uh, we should be vegetarians. So that's something that starts in the ancient world, the idea of ethical treatment of animals. Uh, and the Christians actually turn their back on animal sacrifice. That's something that they don't do which is why we don't do it today. We, we still have barbecues and we still make holidays built around the actual killing and eating of animals, but we wouldn't call it a religious festival. It's called a barbecue and we still do it. We still do it. Uh -huh. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Ab ab I mean, essentially, I, I always include actual historical people because they're just really interesting and they're the movers and the shakers in the ancient world. But uh, I invent plenty of other characters that I need as far as, you know, the crimes, the trials, the, uh, the espionage, the intrigue. Uh, so I, I freely invent my own plots, uh, although oftentimes I'm building around actual trials or wars and things like that. So it's a combination of, of the most fascinating details I can mine from the history, 
plus the things that as a mystery writer, there, there's just certain things I want to do as far as hiding plots and revealing things. Uh, I mean, it, I, I think of myself as sort of equally a mystery writer and a historical writer because I, I want to write historical fiction that sort of opens your eyes about the past, and what's fascinating about it, what's different about it, what's the same about it. But I also, I've, I, I need to have, you know, years ago I heard an agent, I think it was, explain why she liked to uh, deal with mystery plots and, and, uh, and mystery writers. And says, because when you read a mystery novel, there's always a beginning, a middle, and an end. There's always that arc of the story, which if you look at literary fiction, sometimes it's hard to, to figure out. You know, what exactly is this about? It's just common life. But with the mystery fiction, you always have the premise that is set forth. What is the mystery? Why did this happen? How can we get back? Who did it? And then you, through the accretion of details, hiding some of them, revealing others, you eventually come to a resolution at the end where not only have you solved the mystery, you found out what happened and why, but hopefully there's kind of a, a thematic and emotional experience you've also had sort of a, a revelation. So uh, writing mysteries has always satisfied me just as much as writing historical fictions. You always know the ending when you start the, 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 the beginning. Uh, I would say in general, yes, yes. That's the thing I kind of have to have because otherwise I don't know what I'm trying to hide from you. That's, you know, I mean, uh, for me, a, 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 a perfect mystery plot it's, it sort of it has, and there are two plots happening all through the book. There's the visible plot, which here's what's happening is very open and obvious, but there's also an invisible plot that's happening at the same time. Something is happening under the surface. And the writer has to, to do fair play. You've got to put those out in plain sight. You can't just have a rabbit at the end, of, out of a hat at the end of the book. So you've got to have the visible and the invisible plot happening simultaneously. And it's only at the end of the book that they suddenly intersect. And hopefully, if you've done your job right, the reader says, I knew that all along. I mean, you're surprised in a way, but a part of you is like, oh, that was, I saw that happening and I didn't understand. That was the important thing over there that I wasn't looking at real closely. And so I just want, now these, these, these characters you add, where do you draw your influence from? Like, how do you create them, and, and um, how do you develop them as a, as a character that's, that's good? Well, I'm not going to lie. I, I don't think that any author can come up with anything that's outside of his or her own head. So all these characters are somewhere in me. Now, how that got in me, I don't know. Probably from reading thousands of books and watching thousands of movies and actually living a life for 64 years now. So that they all, uh, a writer's character always come out of himself. I mean, that that's just where they all come from. So, that, for example, when I'm when I'm trying to create my Caesar, I've got to find that in me. I've kind of got to look in myself and see what I can find uh, that I can mine from. Um, so hopefully, this, uh, this means yeah. you need to be careful, Al, otherwise you're going to be written into one of another book as in some gladiator outfit. Uh, well, you know, that's something, you know, I, I don't, I do not read other, uh, authors of, uh, Roman historical mysteries, even though there's quite a few out there, like, like Lindsay Davis and others, because I've never wanted to have that thing where unconsciously I steal an idea. You know, I've, I've actually, I've, I, I think I've come up with a new idea. Well, no, actually you, you read that five novels back and that just kind of hung in your mind. So I'm kind of careful about not reading other authors who do anything too close to what I do. I wouldn't look good in an outfit anyway. Mm. I didn't think you'd be all right. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Totally <laughs> wow. Uh, so so uh, this, is this the last one, this, um, book 16, or are you going to continue to do more, or what, what's next then? Well, I, uh, I call The Throne of Caesar the... I guess it's the 14th novel, but it's the 16th book because there's two volumes of short stories. I call it the capstone of the series because um, I, I think, I believe, it's kind of the climax of the series. We finally reached what I wanted to get to, which was the assassination of Caesar. Um, so for now, I would say it's a finished house. We put the capstone in place. 
Now, does that mean we might not build an annex at some point? Perhaps. I never say never. Something might actually pop up, and I've got to, I've got to tell that story next. But uh, for me, I feel very satisfied with kind of the, the whole arc of the story, um, the end of the Roman Republic, the beginning of the empire and the dictatorships. Uh, and then this other series I write, the first novel, Roma, followed by Empire. Those are my big family sagas. The novel I just finished, which we can't find a title yet, uh, is going to kind of finish that off. So I feel like I've written my Roma Rosa mystery series. I've written my historical saga, my, my, my family saga series. So I don't know. I'm 64 years old. I'm told people can retire in their 60s, right? But when I, when I say that to friends, they say, writers never retire. You can't retire. I thought I could. No. <laughs> no? No. No. Apparently I not. mean, you can say you retire, but you always want to do something. Well, exactly. That's, that, that, Exactly. You know, that's I mean, why. Uh, just, what, what would you do then? Well, I'm, you know, I'm, I, I would turn my hand to actual nonfiction and writing history, but that is too much work. You got to do all those footnotes, <laughs> and you, you can't set a foot wrong. You got to justify every single fact. So, I mean, yeah. fiction has always been much easier for me, uh, much more pleasing. So, I, I don't really have the ambition to write actual history. I think that's just that would be that would be a lot of work. Um, so you know what I actually do just as a hobby? I have fallen into the trap of, write, of writing and editing Wikipedia articles because a lot of research I do, I used to scoff at Wikipedia like, uh, oh, the, who, that's it. who knows who's writing that stuff. But then if you need to find just a, a fact or a date, when did a battle happen, when did someone die, you can go to Wikipedia, Julius Caesar, and it's going to be there and it's going to be fairly reliable. And if not, you'll be able to suss it out. But sometimes I go, oh, for example, um, my other half told me, oh, look at this. Have you ever heard of Roman Gatorade? And I said, Roman Gatorade? <laughs> what are you talking about? Well, there's this article online, it's a, the Roman Gatorade. Well, it's a substance called Posca. I must admit I've never heard of this. P-O-S-C-A, Posca. Something that was drunk in ancient Rome. So I thought, okay, what is this Roman Gatorade? What is it talking about? So I go to the Wikipedia article. It's really bad because the Wikipedia article essentially was drawn from these kind of Internet stories which are half-assed. Uh, and what it was, there was this, in the ancient world, they had wine. The Greeks invented wine. The Romans had wine. Uh, it's at all the banquets and so forth. But, you know, wine is really, it's not that cheap. It's for the, it's for the upper class. If you're lower class, if you're a plain person, the best you'll ever get is the sour wine. As the wine began to go off and turn into vinegar... It's still drinkable, but nobody's going to drink this at the banquet, right? So they let the slaves have it. And it's kind of refreshing. It has flavor, uh, sort of a sour drink. So that was called Pasca. So this was something that was suitable for the lower classes, the slaves. And we know that gladiators drank it. And so then it, so all of a sudden, this morphs on the Internet. Oh, this is, this is Roman Gatorade, because gladiators drank it. So this was kind of what they would drink in Gatorade. And uh, not exactly because, you know, it doesn't have any of those, those uh, 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 anti-dehydrating things in it. It's just sour wine, really. So I had to go in and I rewrote the, the article about Pasca, this ancient Roman drink. And there's really only, I think, three or four sources of information. So that's all we know about it. So if you should ever come on, uh, on the Internet, a story with a recipe for Roman Gatorade, do not believe that story. <laughs> that is one of those Internet things. Go to my article on Wikipedia about Pasca. <laughs> of course, by now, someone has probably completely rewritten that article on Wikipedia, so I'd have to go back and fix it again. <laughs> but, but oftentimes in my research, I've come across Wikipedia articles that are just really badly written or just wrongheaded, and I have gone in and done the research necessary to actually do an encyclopedic article on something, some little byway of my research. So as I've gotten older, I must admit, I've fallen into and during the COVID crisis, being at home, <laughs> I fall into the crisis of spending too much time on the Internet and writing too many Wikipedia articles that are supposed to be writing novels. Yeah. Get back to work. Hey, actually, does that, that that brings me up. So when this COVID and things like this go, are going on in the world or something, you know, all the all the uh, protests down in uh, oh, yeah. the cities and stuff like that. So does that sort of um, affect the way you write? And, and if you're writing a fiction or a part of 
fictional character or story in a book, does it become darker or does it influence it? Well, I certainly, you know, I, just as I don't think any any fiction writer can get any characters that are really outside of his own brain, I don't think you can actually write any, you can't write historical fiction that really isn't about your own time. I mean, that's what you're actually doing. You're sort of doing the story of your own time with mirrors. You're making it a little, a little different. So I have this feeling that if my novels, if I'm lucky enough that they're reading them 100 years from now, people will say, oh, Stephen Setter, his books really bring alive the early part of the 21st century, that, that, that sort of mindset that people have. So I, I, I think even as a historical writer, you're always trapped in your own time. I don't like to do that thing of trying to draw parallels between ancient Rome and modern times. I think that gets too complicated and tricky. But I did have something happen that, that was interesting recently. Um, in, the, in the latest book I've written about the, the family saga, we go through some of the worst plagues of the ancient world. Starting under Marcus Aurelius, the time of Commodus, uh, they have this terrible plague. It's one of the things that really brings the empire to its knees. And then later on, we have yet another plague that's really terrible. So this is, these two plagues are one of the big reasons Rome's empire starts fraying and falling apart. Um, and I had written my family saga, and those two events happened in there. And so I had to deal with those ancient plagues. And I, I did this, oh, probably a year ago was when I was writing that, 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 the, 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 those parts of the book. And then lo and behold, we, we come up on this whole COVID thing. And, of course, we've all, you know, had a real psychological blow from this, just dealing with this reality and our emotions about it and so forth, our fear. And uh, so now is my time when I'm rereading my final draft of, of that book. And it was very interesting for me to go in and see if I actually psychologically caught certain things about being in a plague in writing the fiction. And I have to say, it was kind of uncanny. Um, I mean, just certain uh, uh, observations of the characters in certain states of mind. I thought, well, yes, that is kind of what this feels like. So in that case, I actually kind of got to reflect from my own time, looking at what I had actually done about history and seeing if it worked psychologically. So it's all, it's all mm. just a house of mirrors. <laughs> That's interesting. Well, you know, the, but the, the the historical research has got to be the most important, as in when you're writing a story that's happened in 44 BC, um, you've got to have the details surrounding, like your, the, the, oh yeah, what people, the, like the real scenario, how people. Well, are. in in this, I'm really lucky, and it's kind of no accident that you see a lot of stuff about ancient Rome, rather than say. I don't know, ancient Persia or, say, certain parts of medieval Europe, it's because the sources are just so good. I mean, we have all of these, these uh, for example, murder trials. We have these relations from murder trials where you actually get the juicy details and all the family gossip and all that kind of thing. Uh, we have recipe books, not just the ancient Roman gate, right? But we have actual books about, you know, how to, how to make banquets and so forth. We have erotic poetry, uh, we have just all kinds of stuff where we can get inside not just the day-to-day -day life of the ancient Romans, but also their mindset. Um, so in writing about the ancient world, I'm really lucky that way. Now, I was uh, years ago, I was at a, a, a thing called Historicon, which was a gathering of historical mystery writers in Boulder, Colorado. And uh, Cheryl Newman, who writes uh, Medieval Mysteries, was there. And we were on a panel with each other, I think. And I was talking about how lucky I was to have all these fantastic sources. For example, I mean, uh, I, well, anyway, it's just easy to find things about ancient Rome. There's so much material, and ancient historians have been over this. Everything's been translated and so forth. And as I was saying about how rich and, uh, uh, these sources were, next it was Sharon's turn to talk, and she turned to me and she said, I hate you. And it was because in, in, in writing her, her little corner of medieval France or, or whatever, she says they speak uh, uh, various languages just from valley to valley. You, you don't know anything. I mean, it's, we have no, no his, histories of these people. You have no biographies. You have no uh, diaries or memoirs. You really have working from scratch. So it made me uh, just understand why a lot of people do go to ancient Roman Greece because the material is so rich, and just it's, there's so much to explore and, and find out. 
Yeah, certainly. <laughs> have you? Did you do Pompeii already? I guess you probably have done that. Uh, I only deal with Pompeii. That's in my family saga books, and it takes place in the first one called Roma. And because those books take place only in the city of Rome, it's kind of a biography of the city of Rome itself, uh, I couldn't really deal directly with Pompeii. But I thought, well, we've got to have it in there because it's, a, it's, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an earth-shattering event, literally. And it really was a big deal in the ancient world. They lost that city. And, of course, in the superstitious world, what do you make of this? The, the volcano exploded. We lost the whole city. What went wrong? But uh, as I say about finding these great details that you're not expecting, in this case, I got to deal with Pompeii in the city of Rome because we have my characters are having a civilized conversation out of the, in the garden in the city of Rome, looking at the, at, at, at the, 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 the Colosseum in the background. And all of a sudden, there, there starts to be this, this sudden, this, something is falling out of the air. This white powder is falling out of the air, covering everything. And what it was, we really do know that there was a huge ash fall in the city of Rome following Pompeii. So long before they, they heard any news about this, this ash fall occurred. And of course, it scared the wits out of everybody. They'd never seen anything like it. Suddenly, everything is covered with white powder. So that was how they found out in Rome that what had happened to Pompeii. Hmm. That's pretty interesting. It's just a fascinating history. Um, so if people want to find out about your books um, and about you and, and all the stuff, uh, where do you like them to go? Well, the best place to go is stephensailor.com. Uh, it's S-D-E-V-E-N-S-A-Y-L-O-R. I try to make sure I have all my books sort of listed and available, and you can see what's, what's, what's out there. I'm also very active on Facebook. I like sending people. And I, I gotta say, Facebook is a two-way street. I I get more out of Facebook than I put into it because many of them, because I have friends who are not who are just all around the world who are history buffs, and mystery fans, and so forth. And sometimes I've had a question stump me, and I've just gone to Facebook and say, "Can anybody tell me where is the source where Marcus where, where Constantine the Great says Marcus Aurelius was a dunce?" I've read that in a history book. That it's not footnoted. I can't figure out where to find this. And I'll tell you, within a day, I'll have an answer. Somebody will actually point me to the exact source of something. So that the, the social media was another thing that changed my research and you know, my whole way of gathering information uh, because I've got all these friends around the world now who can kind of fill me in on stuff. Yeah, it's pretty uh, pretty amazing how how it's changed the world. There's good points and bad points to it, but uh, it's, the connections you can make it's it's incredible. Oh yeah, it's, 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 uh, that that was an unexpected bonus of being on Facebook. That suddenly I had a code of like an army of people helping me. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's, 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 you know, as long as you can check it out. Oh yes, yeah. oh yeah. Well, they. I, I, but some of these Facebook fans, they know more of the ancient history than I ever will. These are professors from Oxford, you know. So, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a way of... So, yes, uh, it's trustworthy material. Fantastic. Well, it's been a certainly entertaining conversation and a great, great uh, history and mystery all in one. So, well, it fits. Alan, Julie, thank you very much for having me. Well, it's been our pleasure. Um, again, our guest has been Stephen Saylor, and we'll have your website and books up on ours so people uh, listening can do one click and uh, find out who you are. Thank you. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.